It's like 10 thousandths too small. Okay, I think it's finally time to actually do the re-gear for real on the Dinga 30. I have a new carrier. This time it is an actual Spicer part. It's not a Yukon part, so hopefully this works. I'll put a link in the description for this one. And I would say get this one, not the Yukon one, if you're actually doing your own gears. First things first, I want to get the locker put in. So I actually bought two different Yukon carriers for the 30, and neither one of them worked. Both of them had cross pin holes that were too small. All right, let's put this thing together. I always put these pieces in in the wrong order. There. Now for the pin, the moment of truth. It's in there. All right, time to put the ring gear on. Well, looks like the ring does not want to go on. I was afraid of this. It's really cold in the garage. Let's see if I can heat it up. Now depending on what kind of uh, carrier you're using or what size bolts are in your particular Dana 30, Yukon gives you two different torque specs for those. Right here, Dana 30, not the JK Dana 30, but the Dana 30, ring bolt torque is either one or two. If you come down here, number one is three eighths bolts is 55 foot pounds, seven sixteenths bolts is 75 foot pounds. So I already measured mine, so I checked mine right here with my little uh, nut gauge, and mine are 3 8 24 thread. So I'll, be, so I'll be torquing these to 55 foot-pounds. All right, 55 foot-pounds. I got it set up into my vise here with some soft jaws. Okay, so this is ready to get some shims, and I'm going to use setup bearings right here, just so I can slide them on and off real easy, um, and I'll be able to adjust the shims if I need to. Alright, I'm going to go ahead and change these axle seals. Get this pinion out finally. Ah. 
Look at the size difference on that guy. Okay, so I just spent like the last hour making this. This is a setup nut. Uh, I took this is the original nut off of the uh, stock pinion, and I took a burr bit. Well, first of all, I took it to the bench grinder and cleaned it up really good because it was covered in gunk. Then I took a burr bit, and I just went around on the inside, particularly on uh, this side of the nut, the rounded side, and I just ground down all of the threads that are inside, and that way it's not cutting into the new pinion threads when I screw it on. So here's the new pinion right here in my new setup nut going on with no problem. So I'll set up the gears with this you know and I'll make sure it all goes together right and then when I'm ready to fully set this pinion and yoke officially I'll use the new nut. So here's what that nut looks like. You can see where I ground the threads down. Okay, so here's my setup bearings. There we go. You see how that works. So I'll be able to uh, change the shims out under these if I need to without, you know, pulling the bearings on and off. I had to move the camera out of the way, but I got it out of there. So here's the rear of the, or you know, the tail section of the pinion. Uh, this tail bearing, the race for the tail bearing, once it goes in, it doesn't have to come out again. So there is no setup for that. So here's the tail bearing right here. So I'm going to go ahead and hammer this race into the rear of the diff housing. All right, I got it all cleaned up in there. Got my new race. On the back of the pinion, there is an oil slinger, which I have a new one right here. Here's the tail bearing and the old tail bearing race, the new one of which we just hammered in. So this shim stack is how you set the bearing preload on a high pinion. So this piece looked a lot different before I hammered it out of there, but that's just the way it looked after I was done getting it out, but it originally looked like this. It's got a raised lip on it so that when the bearing, when it pokes out from behind the race like that, that little lip, that little shoulder will fit over it. And then you put shims behind this. So this race may need to come out several times to get the, uh, you know, the pinion depth set up right. And that's where the setup race will come in handy. Because I can just slide it in and out, and it doesn't it doesn't need to be hammered in, uh, you know, or hammered out to be removed. So we'll get the pinion depth correct, make sure the shims are correct, and then I'll hammer in the real one. I wasn't planning on pulling any of the old bearings off, uh, but I thought about it some more, and I'm actually going to pull these old bearings off, both on the pinion and on the carrier cut the uh, cage off so that I can use that inner the inner portion of the bearing as a spacer when I press on the new ones uh, I hope that makes sense so I'm gonna I have the tool to pull these off so I'm gonna grab that and start pulling some old bearings off that's the 
the one. There it is, one perfectly good unharmed bearing that I'm about to cut up. So obviously this tool is awesome, uh, worked perfect. I'll leave links in the description for all the specialty tools that I used, uh, you know, in case you're interested. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and press the slinger and the inner bearing on using this one. Perfect, as a guide. Gotta hammer that guy off. Okay, so I just went through and I measured all of my old shims. Some of them were really hard to measure, like this guy, but uh, from my best measurements, this is exactly the same thickness as the new one. I cleaned up all these shims, and as I was wiping them off, uh, I realized that what I thought was one shim was actually two really thin ones. So I split all the shims apart, wiped them off really good, measured them individually so that I wasn't measuring any oil or anything. So here's my particular YJ, Dana 30. All the shims individually, and then what the total... Uh, you know, thicknesses for each one. So I'm going to go through my, my new shims and I'm going to build a new shim stack out of new shims to match this as close as I can. You could reuse some of these shims, but there's a lot of them, especially these really thin ones that they got damaged and warped when they got, when I had to take them out. So I can't, I can't reuse those. I got my new shim pack right here that goes behind the race and I got my new preload shims right here ready to go. Also got my new yoke 
I cleaned up the washer that goes in there, and I got my setup nut. Oh, and here's the setup race. Okay, so I just spent like the last hour at the bench grinder, slowly turning the outer diameter of this race down, because apparently East Coast Gear Supply did not send me the setup race that I ordered. They just sent me a regular race. So I got that turned down with a bench grinder. Could really use a lathe, but whatever, got it done. Thanks, East Coast Gear Supply. about 14 in this direction so this actually looks like it's gonna be this preload looks like it's gonna be right right off the bat so that's cool so non ring gear side gets 35 thousandths and a setup bearing and a race The ring side gets 52 thousandths on mine, set up bearing, and a race. Alright, let's go check, see how it fits. I don't feel any backlash. I don't think this has any backlash, but let's check anyway. Yeah, I don't feel any backlash whatsoever. No, none. Take it out. Okay, so to increase backlash, I need to move the carrier away from the pinion. So I need to add some shims on this side. So I'm going to take a 10,000th shim off of this side and add it to this side. And that should move it 20 thousandths away from the pinion, which should give me about 14 thousandths of backlash if there is currently zero. So let's see what happens here. Okay, let's try again. Okay, so I actually had to take it back out and move another 10 thousandths shim over. So 20 thousandths total has been moved over from this side to this side. But now, I got some backlash. So let's measure that. Now we're getting somewhere, but I've only got 5 thousandths of backlash, so I need to add another five. All right, I traded a 20 thousandths shim for a 10 thousandths shim. I just swapped them, moved it away a little bit more. Look at that. That is right at 12, between 12 and 13 thousandths, which is dead center in the middle of the spec of 10 to 15. All right, I'm gonna check pattern now. Now, this is the part I'm kind of worried about. I'm worried that the pinion is going to be too deep or too shallow or something, you know. And checking the pattern is something that's like, there's no real like measurement for that. You know, you can't just like look at a tool and know if it's good or not. You have to judge the way it looks and compare it to some photos. You know, like, that's what it should look like. But, I don't know, it can be kind of hard to read, I guess, for me anyway, since this is the first time I've ever done it. So I'm going to do what I can, and we'll see how it comes out. That is really thick. Alright, let's go paint some teeth.
This is what I was afraid of. See that defined line at the very bottom of the pattern? Like towards the root of the teeth? Uh, I think the pinion is too deep. I think it's too close. So I gotta pull the carrier out, pull the pinion out, change the shims behind the setup race for the pinion, put it all back together, and then check everything again. Alright, so I've been going back and forth. I've had this carrier out probably 30 times at this point. I really wasn't happy with the, the backlash being so high in that in the Yukon manual, so I set it right at 10 thousandths, which is right on the line of a typical new gear setup and what the Yukon manual calls for. So I'm going to run with that. Um, the final pattern looks okay. It's probably, I mean, it's not perfect, but it's, I think it's okay. So I'm going to go with this. I'm going to pull it all apart now and press on the real bearings and hope that once I get it all assembled the final time that it still looks okay. One thing I noticed too, every time I was driving the pinion out to change the either the preload shims or the the depth shims or whatever, every time I used the air hammer to drive it out, it would loosen this bearing. So this shouldn't spin. This oil slinger shouldn't spin. But just the act of the air hammer hitting it, you know, would loosen it up a little bit. So if you do this, make sure you repress the pinion bearing on every time you knock it out. All right, the shim stack and the little cup washer shim and the real race. right at 15 so that's good I was really worried about this part the pinion bearing preload is kind of like the most nerve-wracking part for me for some reason but uh, that's right at 15 so I'm gonna pull the setup nut back off pull the yoke off I'll tap in the new seal then I'll put the yoke on and put the real nut on for the first last time. Got the yoke covered in a little bit of grease. We got the washer coated in a little bit of grease. And before I put it on, the instructions say to put a to put a dab of red Loctite on it, so that's exactly what I'm going to do. I guess you shouldn't need that really, but whatever. Oh, that is perfect. Right between 13 and 15. So, that's it. Pinion is done. Well, I'm not super happy with that pattern, but I think it's going to be okay. I don't want to get caught up in chasing perfection because I don't think it's possible. So I'm going to call it good and put this front end back together.
How in God's name did I overfill it that much? I almost forgot to bolt the drive shaft back in. Alright, this is it. Tires are going on. It's on its own weight for the first time with the 35s. Alright, it's kind of late and it's kind of dark outside, but I gotta drive it. I gotta know if it's gonna make noise. I'm so nervous. I'm gonna run it in two-wheel drive, obviously, and uh, not put it in four-wheel drive, but I'm still gonna do the break-in as if, you know, the whole thing was re-geared. So I'm gonna drive it for like 15 minutes, park it for 30, drive it for 15 minutes, park it for 30, that kind of thing. This thing barely fits in the garage now, but it does fit. Well, I'm calling that a success. I took it on two, like, 15-minute drives just around my neighborhood and up and down a couple streets with, like, 45, 55 mile an hour speed limits, you know, and uh, just kind of varied my speed, varied how hard I was hitting the brakes, and, you know, just kind of feeling it out since I haven't driven it with 35s yet. I'm really tempted to remove the rear drive shaft and put it in four-wheel drive so that it's technically in front-wheel drive and see how it feels with the 456s. I'm betting it's going to feel really good, but with the front locker in there, it makes it really hard to drive on pavement uh, with the front locked. So I'm going to hold off on that. I'm going to get, I'm going to get the rear axle re-geared, and then I'll uh, you know put some real load on the front axle when I put it in four-wheel drive and go cruising around in the dirt somewhere just to make sure everything's good. But for now, I'm calling it a win. I'm finally done re-gearing the front. I finally have my diff cover, my solid diff cover on the front axle to match the rear. And at this point, I'm just, I just gotta do the rear axle and then I'll be done with uh, drivetrain for the most part. It looks awesome. I love the way it looks on 35s. 